we only have 60 harvests left and maybe 60 to 80 years left of human life, like that, that those were corresponding so closely. But then in the end, it has to be that close because ultimately we're talking about the vitality of a planet, not a single species. And so we are seeing the extinction of about one species every 20 minutes. We've had a 10,000 fold acceleration of the extinction rate that's natural to kind of the turnover of life on Earth. 10,000 times accelerated over the last 40 years. And so we are putting this extinction level stress on the planet. Are we nearing uh, or heading towards an extinction as a human race now? We're speeding towards it, speeding towards it. It's an extraordinary rate. When I started you know, working on the science around this, the public health statistics, everything else was 2010, 12. At that time, we had 80 to 100 years left of extinction, uh, you know, pattern does collapse. And when I started working with farmers and agricultural systems at large in 2015, 16, and then started our film in 2017, um, was listening to a lecture on a farm up in Minnesota and a PhD in, in agronomy uh, was giving the talk right before me and he said uh, in kind of a hair-raising look at how fast we're losing topsoil systems and the vitality of the earth, he said we've got 60 harvests left on the planet. And I was so jaw-dropped at that moment. In hindsight, it should have been predictable, but I was jaw-droppingly coincidental it felt that we only have 60 harvests left and maybe 60 to 80 years left of human life, like that, that those were corresponding so closely. But then in the end, it has to be that close because ultimately we're talking about the vitality of a planet, not a single species. And so we are seeing the extinction of about one species every 20 minutes. We've had a 10,000 fold acceleration of the extinction rate that's natural to kind of the turnover of life on earth. 10,000 times accelerated over the last 40 years. And so we are putting this extinction level stress on the planet, which has happened before, five other big extinction events in history. Uh, last one 55 million years ago, which was actually a death of the topsoils that caused that. And so here we are now the existential threat being humans killing the topsoils of the planet, and we're seeing the collapse of species as, as the vitality of soil disappears. And that's inevitable because ultimately biology is an expression of energetics. We are light beings, whether we be a lion in the bush or Zach Bush uh, over here, you've got these two life forms that are expressing light energy in a physical body. And the physical body is capturing light energy from the transfer of, of energy from the sun down into the soil system through microbial life and its interaction with the sunlight with green plants, that interface is where light energy is captured. And then we pull that in through our food system. And when it's liberated by our mitochondria inside of our cells, it turns back into light energy. And so we run on solar light. It's, it's not just solar energy, it's light. We run on light, light energy. And the planet does at large, whether you're an earthworm or snake or a human being, you're running on light energy. And so as we use chemical and technological you know, disruptions in that interface between sun, plant, and soil, all of the vitality of the planet drops. And we can map this by our cancer rates that have exploded, our neurologic degenerative conditions, autism to Alzheimer's dementia, we can do it by autoimmune conditions where our immune system becomes the natus of attack on our own bodies. You know, it's extraordinary when you become your own problem at the biologic level. I think we're used to being our own problem up in our head, but when that becomes a biologic phenomenon where your own immune system sees you as the enemy, mm. that's an extraordinary shift. That's an extraordinary breakdown in communication at the cellular level that would allow you to see yourself as, as the enemy. But when we back up with that extinction level thing, we are the enemy. We are the thing that's driving this, this you know, blade between nature and our own expression of that light energy. And so we are separating, schisming ourselves again and again from nature. And in so doing, we are losing the vitality within life on Earth. And it's a, it's a moment where we've become the greatest problem. And if we will zoom in and see that source of the problem, there's an opportunity for us to suddenly know ourselves not as some sort of you know, tip of the pyramid of life on Earth, some keystone species that you know, is smarter and more intelligent than any other and therefore you know, more vital and we're more important and we can push life back so there's more room for us and more room for more of us. That's what we've been doing for tens of thousands of years. 
now we have the opportunity to realize, oh my God, this is not an us and them story. This is a story of life itself, and it relies on this interface of the soil systems within our bodies, which are reliant on the soil systems on the ground below us. And so we are this expression of nature, which is super exciting, because when we come to that realization of who we are, we can start to express a much different version of humanity. Mm -hmm. And it's humbling, right? Because if we think you're a light being, I'm a light being, a lion's a light being, but also the person in my eyes is the worst person and the best person are all light beings, then it's pretty humbling being like, oh, we're kind of all the same. When we remove the ego and really come back to what is the essence of us as human beings? Taking Ned's Mellow Magnesium is a super impactful part of my day. It's part of my ritual knowing that a lot of people, including me, sometimes will not get enough magnesium. So I know that because I've simplified my intake of supplements, I really just take the ones that I need and magnesium is one of them. Now Ned's Mellow Magnesium is a powerful supplement and it's binded with amino acids and trace minerals as a whole. So it's more than just magnesium. And taking this is really helpful for one, my muscles are much more relaxed. My nervous system is a lot more relaxed. My mood, my brain function, memory. You see how magnesium just is a big blanket over our health? Really important mineral that we need to be taking. So, mellow magnesium, I noticed that, especially with sleep, when I take the night one, put it into water, mix it up, and take my little magnesium drink before bed, I always end up sleeping deeper because my nervous system is more at rest. When it comes to Ned's products, they're known for their CBD. And they use full spectrum of active cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, and trichomes. Their full spectrum hemp oil nourishes the body's endocannabinoid system. And this helps offer functional support for stress, sleep, inflammation, and balance. So to become the best version of you, get 15% off of Ned's products with the code DRG. Go to helloned.com slash DRG. Enter the code DRG at checkout. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash DRG. You're going to get 50% off. Thank you, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering the Heal Thyself viewers and listeners a natural remedy for life's most common issues. One of my favorite partners here at Heal Thyself is Athletic Greens. It's really easy to take and helps provide nutrients and energy for your body, especially when you're running around. It is so convenient. And the thing is, it doesn't taste super healthy even though it is. It's actually got a mild tropical taste that does not utilize synthetic natural flavors, but on the contrary, it's coming from pineapple and vanilla. But it's something I look forward to every single morning. So what is it? One scoop with Athletic Greens, you're gonna get 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that are gonna help your day start right. And it's got less than a gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals. None of that artificial crap that I'm telling you to stay away from. And it tastes good. It supports better sleep quality and recovery and mental clarity and alertness overall. And it's beautiful because it's a small micro habit that you do every single day, but it builds up and you begin taking better care of yourself nutritionally just by having the support of something like Athletic Greens. Now, you know I only partner with brands that I believe in. Athletic Greens is one of them. They're a great company focused on sustainability. For one, they're climate neutral certified company. And in 2020, they purchased carbon credits to support projects protecting old growth rainforest. Additionally, for every purchase, they donate to organizations that are helping to get nutritious foods to children, especially the No Kid Hungry, right here in the United States. In 2020, Athletic Greens donated over 1.2 million meals to children. Now we're talking. So, to make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs for your first purchase. All you gotta do is visit athleticgreens.com slash heal thyself. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash heal thyself to take ownership of your health and pick the ultimate nutritional daily insurance. When we think about the sun, we think about, oh, we get some vitamin D, right? And it helps uh, establish our circadian rhythms. It is so much deeper. It is sustaining life itself. And the way you put it, how it interfaces with the soil and the plants and we're eating it and bringing in light to our body, sustaining life. That's beautiful, but you mentioned the technologies that are affecting it. Is that the biggest threat to the soil systems? The pesticides, the herbicides, what is it that is ruining this at such an accelerated rate? 
Yeah, I'll try to do that in two fold. The number one fold is the technology. So it started with the plow, actually. If you pick up a Western civilization textbook, it often will say that Western civilization started around 900 AD or something like this with the invention of the plow. And now we zoom out you know, another 1,100 years later and we find out that the plow is killing the planet. And so the very thing that allowed us to scale farming beyond just having all of, our, all of us having our own backyard gardens and having to be completely self-sufficient with the food that we produce, which was the case for thousands of years, we started to subspecialize at a grand scale with the invention of the plow. And suddenly a farmer could use this mechanized tool dragging behind an oxen that would tear up soil at, at grand speeds compared to that shovel, and they could suddenly farm a whole bunch of land. Uh, mechanized mechanisms for taking down forests and speeding up the process of you know, taking timber out so that you could clear more land for farmland and then you could plow that up. It turns out that the plow is a violent tool for disrupting the fungi specifically, but in so doing, the entire microbiome. So bacteria, fungi, protozoa, parasites, then things like nematodes. Nematodes are a massive part of life on Earth and then into earthworms and the like. This massive explosion of life within the soil is undermined when you continue to push that plow multiple times a year through the soil disrupting the macro eco ecosystem and architecture of that intelligent soil system. So as the soil system is, is collapsing in its intelligence and its capacity for communication and resource sharing and all the rest, anything that would grow out of that soil starts to diminish in its light energy and vitality as you speak it. Uh, the vitality within a plant that grows, a tomato plant example, or mint plant that seems to be indestructible, you grow that mint, what's happening is, is this extraordinarily amazing quantum event is happening at its root fibrils. Uh, the root fibrils of a plant under a microscope have these little villi, these little tiny projections like a coral reef almost that are reaching out into the soil system. And then there's the mycelium, which are the root systems of the fungi that are growing in massive networks. The mycelium are now considered the largest creatures on Earth, the largest organisms on the planet. They can cover you know, square miles. And the mycelium are their own network of fiber optic cables that move light energy, and just like a fiber optic cable does for communication. So they communicate between the species. So a beech tree can communicate with the evergreen nearby so that it can get the right nutrients to that beech. The beech will typically grow in soils that don't have the nutrients that beech tree needs to live. Instead, the beech tree will grow near a evergreen that's capable of producing the nutrients that it will pass through the mycelium to the beech tree. So the soil doesn't provide the nutrients the evergreens do. And so this is the magic of the mycelium. Is not only is it a fiber optic network of communication, it, those networks of communication can also carry macronutrients. And so the very, not only is it communicating what it needs, it's carrying the resources that would meet those needs. And so it's the most brilliant communication you know, resource management system on the planet. We have not approached the, the function of mycelium in all of our technology. We, all of our fiber optic cables, they only do the communication piece. Mm -hmm. Your fiber optic network is not passing resources yeah. to and fro. And so we need to, to really change that, that understanding of how nature does things. Nature does things interconnected and always sharing. It's a sharing economy that sees that the goodness of any species is the goodness of the whole. And so that's the very beautiful thing. And then this magic happens between those root fibrils and the, and the mycelial network, there's a new thing that forms between them to allow the light energy transfer and energetics to occur, and that's called the mycorrhizae. And the mycorrhizae is not a species. It doesn't have a genetic sequence that allows it to occur. And so, instead, it seems to be some strange like co-creation of the mycelium and the pr plant roots that have the, the genetics necessary to make the proteins and all the structural things that would become mycorrhizae. And so the, it's basically a co-imagination between the mycelium and the roots of a tree or the roots of a mint plant or tomato. They imagine this interface, this, this new connective tissue of life called the mycorrhizae. And you've seen this probably, if you've ever dug a hole in the ground, they look kind of like spider webs mm. or like hair yeah. in the earth. And that is, is the mycorrhizae. And the mycorrhizae is capable of this energetic exchange between the two things, the plant and the mycelial network. And that kind of imaginative co-creation 
is what the plow destroys. And so you're tearing through that and over and over again, disrupting that whole matrix. You're losing communication and you're losing uh, resource management and transfer. Then you add chemicals. So the Green Revolution in the 1950s coming out of World War II was where we repurposed petroleum into the chemical industry. The war had seen the biggest expansion of the oil and gas industry in history. A global mechanized war put a huge demand on oil uh, globally, and so we were making refined you know, gasoline and diesel and all this for global fleets of, of mechanized warfare. And then the war ended, and we had this huge you know, production capacity for oil that had never been at that level before. And so we, we said, well, we can, what, what else can we do with all this oil? And the answer was, well, we make tons of interesting chemicals out of it. So we made nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizers for soil. You remember the, the, the U.S. had gone through the Dust Bowl right before World War II. We had completely killed all of our soils through over-farming and over-plowing. And so instead of going back and saying, wow, we should compost and we should recreate soil and we should build everything through our indigenous wisdom, as to, instead we said, oh, we can take chemicals that had been chemical warfare and we can start turning them into fertilizer uh, for the soils. And it was a boon. Suddenly everything went green and plants were growing big again and there was abundance of harvests. And what we didn't realize at the time was we were pushing the, the accelerator pedal down on carbon extraction from the earth. When you pour nitrogen into soil, it accelerates the carbon cycle. And carbon cycles are really what allow for life to, to have form. So while the sunlight is what gives it the energy, carbon is the matrix of, uh, of life itself. So it's responsible for building the backbone of molecules and cells and all kinds of stuff within the human body or biology at large. And so when you disrupt that carbon cycle, or, or when you accelerate the nitrogen and you suck all the carbon out of the soil, you end up without enough substrate to build health. And so within a few years of pouring all this nitrogen into the soils of the earth, we started to see weaker plants. And so we started getting invasive weeds, we started seeing uh, invasive fungi on the plants, and uh, you know, we saw mold phenomena that had never been seen before killing crops. And so, what had happened is, is we had sucked the vitality of, of, of Earth out through too much nitrogen. And instead of saying, wow, what's the, what problem have we created? We just said, well, we need some drugs for the plants. Right. So let's do antibiotics, antifungals, antiparasites, anti this. Uh, so many invasive weeds, we need some weed killers. So let's go herbicides, herbicides, pesticides, pesticides. And that became our agriculture of today. By the 1970s, we were pouring awful chemicals that, uh, Atrazine was the the major one, and atrazine is a carcinogenic and just gross toxin, and it's bad for farmers, it's bad for everybody. And a new new chemical got grabbed and, and patented, um, a re refreshed patent. It was originally found in 1958, but in 1974, Monsanto patented glyphosate as a weed killer. And, and in that moment, in that we moment. saw this big transition period of um, chemical usage. And so uh, they said this is the new safe safe herbicide, uh, so much so that when, for many years it was the, the tagline was glyphosate or Roundup, safer than water, mm -hmm. you know, and that it, somebody would have the egoic capacity to say that something was safer for biology than water is an extraordinary statement anyways, but it was such a gross overstepping of the science that even in the 1980s, Monsanto was understanding the carcinogenic effects of their own chemicals there, but the they, were, they thought that the doses necessary to cause cancer were super high compared to what could be sprayed on weeds. So they thought, oh, the environmental exposure for humans is low enough that it can't cause cancer. But in 1986 and 88, when they were publishing their own cancer data, they couldn't have imagined what was going to happen in 1996, which was by accident, one of their scientists figured out how to hybrid a bacterium that had become resistant to the Roundup chemical into plants, and we got the, the first GMO-ready crops. And so GMO first was actually squash, uh, and then came corn, soybean, and all the rest. And now we have you know, well over 30 crops that are genetically modified routinely, even things that are non-food, petunias, roses, all genetically modified to be sprayed with Roundup. So. The crop, is important to understand, is not genetically modified to improve its health. It's not genetically modified to yield more corn. It's genetically modified so it can be sprayed with a toxin throughout its life cycle. And so it's very important that GMO Ready, we understand, is not there to feed the world. GMO Ready is to, to sell more herbicides. 
that phenomenon really kicked in in 1976 when broad spraying started to happen. And through the 80s, we got you know higher and higher concentrations into our water systems. And then in 1992, uh, 91, 92 was this big new aha moment as a farmer had discovered that the technique was that if he sprayed his entire crop with, with Roundup right before harvest, he would dry the wheat faster and could get more of the wheat to market. So it got re-patented as a desiccant or drying agent that would be sprayed broadly across not just wheat, but all of the legumes, just things like soybeans and uh, the chickpeas and all of these legumes that have to be dry at the time or else they mold and everything else. And so days before harvest, days before it's ground into flour, you're saturating these, these fields with this chemical. So in 1992, we see an explosion of the usage of Roundup and the number, number of pounds per acre could be used and because no longer are you trying to just spot spray the weeds, you're killing the entire field. And at that moment, we invented gluten sensitivity. And so gluten carrying glyphosate in it becomes a real toxin to the, the tight junctions of the gut and you get leaky gut. And so the beginning of our journey into the schism of losing soil systems was the plow. And the final destruction was the introduction of glyphosate uh, as a, a main carrying agent for this disruption of life. And what we've, our laboratory has been working on glyphosate for 10 years over that now, but um, over that 10 years, we've studied in all species, uh, you know, from, well, rodents all the way to humans. You can show over and over again, whether it's the gut, the blood vessels, the blood-brain barrier, the kidney tubules, glyphosate blows apart the communication. It, it lyses all of the fiber optic network of the human system. So each cell in the human with 70 trillion cells, like the fiber optic network of the mycelium, are connected through these light channels, these, these tubes called gap junctions. And glyphosate cleaves all of those gap junctions, just like the plow cleaves all of that. In, in the soil system. And so through this one-two punch of overplowing and overspraying of herbicides, and then those herbicides ending up as residues in our own gut and in our own bloodstream, water-soluble toxin goes into anything with water. And so my whole body, 70% water, will suck up that glyphosate circulated through every single cell in the body, and it's cutting light, it's cutting light. And so I'm in damage control all the time as a modern consumer because every day I'm being exposed to this chemical. 80% of the air I breathe as an American is contaminated with glyphosate. 80, 85% of the rainfall that falls in the United States is contaminated with Roundup. And so this water-soluble molecule is now circulating through the entire hydraulic cycle, and we are being saturated by something that literally cleaves the mechanism of light transfer. And for that, our lights are dimming, and the extinction becomes inevitable. Mm. Zach, I often don't uh, have no words to say <laughs> after someone goes on their, on their piece here, but it, it's, it's hard for me to even hear where we are as a species, but in that beautiful understanding of like, from plow to water-soluble toxin in my body that's dimming my light, it makes so much sense. And the, the way that you illustrate the connection between just humanity as a whole and nature is inseparable. Right, it's it is it is doing the same. That we are those plants that are sick with bacteria and mold and fungi, right? And we are going to the doctors and getting the same thing, those antibiotics, right, to take care of us rather than going what what happened to the soil, and what's happening to our soil, and I'm always in awe of when I hear because I understand glyphosate when I hear people say no, glyphosate is 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 fine. The dose makes the poison. You'll be fine. Uh, there's no good studies that show it causes cancer. Every governing body in science says it's, it's safe. What do you say when people say that to you? Inevitably, you get that all the time. Yeah. Well, first of all, I say, you know, show me, show me your study in your lab. And, you know, because people are extracting information from industry studies to, to, to report the safety. In our laboratory, we've taken it down to two parts per billion of glyphosate, and it can show the damage. And so two parts per billion is not even detectable in a normal water system. And so uh, we don't have the mechanisms to show you this. And it's two parts per million, so a thousand-fold more than the two parts per billion is, is showing up in your food. So two parts per billion would be a very... Uh, 
easy thing for me to show toxicity, two parts per million, a thousand times more concentrated, is what's going to show up in your carrots, your sweet potato, your beets, anything grown in the ground, all your root vegetables, which are, of course, the, the root vegetables that carry the highest amount of plant medicine and you know, the, the incredible alkaloids and the, the medicine within our food is growing in these colorful root vegetables. And yet now they're the harbinger of death and in the form of this glyphosate molecule. And so it's... First of all, I know beyond a shadow of any doubt that I know this thing kills human cells and I know it disrupts human vitality at this fabric level because I've seen it under the microscope again and again and again. But second of all is the way in which industry you know, controls information. And so my group has been a part of you know, multi-specialty, multi-interest groups that have uh, gone and testified before the EPA three times in the last five years. And so when the EPA has an open session of, like, we're reviewing glyphosate again, they just reviewed it for desiccant use, you know. And so we rushed in there again, 196 peer-reviewed science journals showing that it's carcinogenic at these low doses, showing that it's damaging to immune systems, that every acre we spray increases the correlation between leukemias, bladder cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, liver cancer, thyroid cancer, 196 studies. And at the end of that, you know, three-hour testimony, the head of the EPA stands up, and or the head of the the EPA sector that we're presenting to stands up, and she says, you know, thank you for presenting all of this. Unfortunately, we can't turn this into regulatory documents because you haven't filled out an official, uh, you know, regulatory form for for this. And mm-hmm. we say, no problem. Show us the regulatory form. She says, well, there isn't actually a regulatory form. You know, so it's like this amazing. Levels of denial, levels of like, well, we're, we're imp- disempowered as regulators to actually make change is the message that's there. So then, well, who can make change? And unfortunately, or fortunately, the answer is you. Each of us can make the change. Mm. And it's going to come down to us demanding that our U.S. government does the same thing that the Europeans have demanded, which is we want labeling. We want glyphosate to be measured in every bite of food. We want to be able to make a decision as a consumer. Do I want two parts per million or do I want two parts per billion of glyphosate? Probably can't get it to zero right now because it's in our water table, it's in our everything. But having a thousand-fold difference between your carrot and you know, clean water would be a remarkable opportunity. So we've got to have testing in place and we've got to have clear labeling in place. Uh, did the farmer directly use GMO and spray? You can't tell on labels. We have these non-GMO labels, which are ending up all over the place now that are very hard to tell, like, what does that really mean for this, like, g- granola bar? You know, is the granola... Okay, so the, the oats in there are non-GMO? Like, you know, but you can actually use a lot of glyphosate just because it's non-GMO. Non-GMO doesn't mean it was organic. It just means that right. it wasn't genetically modified to sp- be sprayed directly with it. But you can use a lot of glyphosate... For example, wheat is non-GMO, and then they use it as a desiccant. They spray it to kill it. Non-GMO is so it survives and it lives a lifespan and produces crop. But the, most of the crops being sprayed with the highest concentrations, legumes, wheat, etc., are non-GMO and being sprayed with Roundup to kill it or dry it at the end of its lifespan. Yeah. So there's all of these loopholes in a non-GMO labeling world that allows glyphosate to be at higher so, Glyphosate's not hard to measure in food. Why are we not demanding that this primary chemical? And when I say primary chemical, it's a huge number. We are spraying 2 billion kilograms annually into the soils and water systems of the world globally now. 2 billion kilograms. Well, 300 million of that is being sprayed in the United States. So, you know, there's 200 countries plus around the world. So we're using the bulk of that 2 billion but that means there's still you know, 1.7 billion pounds being sprayed outside of the United States. And the countries that are leading the charge there are things like Brazil, Argentina, South Africa. India is coming on strong right now. So we've got these developing world economies that are starting to adopt these Western you know, farming agricultural practices, chemical practices that are accelerating the extinction of the planet and humanity. Element is a super tasty electrolyte drink. If you haven't tried it, it's really good and super hydrating. What it is, is providing your body with the necessary electrolytes. This is a science-based electrolyte ratio they're using. Here's what it is. 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. 
It's got no sugar, no artificial coloring, artificial ingredients, gluten, fillers, none of that crap. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited for your lifestyle following a keto, low-carb, paleo, vegan, whatever it is. We all need electrolytes. It's super important to replenish your electrolytes, especially if you're working your body, sweating, going in the sauna, live an active lifestyle, whatever it is, we need electrolyte replenishment and balance every single day. When you're electrolyte deficient, you may feel headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, sleeplessness, right? These are common symptoms of electrolyte deficiency. Now for me, I know when I'm getting hydrated, I feel good in my body, less headaches, more focus, less fatigue. So when I'm drinking my water, especially when it's going through the reverse osmosis process, I need to replenish it with electrolytes. These are the ones that I use by Element. So right now, Element is offering the listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. You're gonna get eight single serving packets free with any order. Now this is a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a friend. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash DRG. The deal is only available through my link, drinklmnt.com slash DRG. It's hard to take in, right? It's hard to really listen to this and be like, it can't be this bad. How can it possibly be this bad? I would know if it was this bad. Governments would know if right, it's this bad. Right. So we have all of these defense mechanisms like Zach is saying all these things like, it can't be this bad. But in the end, I think that there's one thing that I think everybody is now one degree of separation from, and that's fertility. Look at the rate of change in human fertility over just the last 10 years. 15 years ago, a few people would have to have in vitro fertilization. Today, the number of people that are undergoing infertility treatment with in vitro fertilization and the like is truly astounding, exponential increase from just 15 years ago. And if you look at sperm counts, it answers a lot of this issue. And so sperm counts in Western civilization in the 1970s before the dawn of all the chemicals I just told you about was about 100 million sperm per milliliter. Fast forward to today, 50 years later, and really accelerating the last 30, but 50 years later, even 40, we'd hit these numbers by 2010. So 40 years between 1970 and 2010, we lost 52% on average. In the United States, it was 57% of our sperm counts uh, per milliliter. So average sperm count now is well under 50 uh, million per milliliter. To get that as the center of the bell curve as an average, one third of males in the United States are now infertile by sperm count, one third. So why so much in vitro fertilization? Because we no longer have sperm that can swim. We no longer have eggs that can bond to those, those uh, sperm heads correctly and get that fertilization to occur. And so I wish it was just a Western medicine problem, but I was just in India in, uh, in the last couple of weeks and I took a picture on, multiple times in traffic because here you are in, in Mumbai traffic, which is probably the most chaotic traffic scene you've ever seen in your life. And so you've got a million little rickshaws and tuk-tuks and you got the taxis and you got buses and you got people and cows and the whole thing mashed up. And on the backs of all these tuk-tuks are advertisements with big phone number, call this phone number for in vitro fertilization. Whoa. In vitro all over India? All over India. Wow. And so... This is not a Western problem. This is a universal problem now throughout the world where we cannot reproduce. And that's when you go extinct as a species. And so this is the crisis we're in. And we have negative population growth in most countries now. China, US, lots of places. Only place where we really have positive growth right now is in, in Africa. And sperm counts actually improved over the last 50 years there, but they've only improved to the same average we've declined to. So they have poor fertility in Africa used to be due to, to malnutrition. Now it's the pressure of chemicals and everything else that we're putting in there. Um, but it's, it's a real crisis point right now on the planet of are we going to be able to reproduce in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And so this extinction event is really one of a loss of fertility and then the, the pressure of downward pressure on longevity and all of that by chronic disease will do it. But chronic disease isn't what makes you go extinct because it tends to show up in your third, fourth decade of life at the earliest. It, it's really the, the drop in sperm counts and, and the health of the eggs within the female population where we really see this. Mm. And so uh, we're, we're at a tipping point. And 
again, I have this deep optimism within me is that this is not bad news. It's taking us back to the truth. It's taking us back to the truth that we left a long time ago, which is humans are not against nature. Nature is not against humans. We have been hunting to extinction anything bigger than us for hundreds of thousands of years, literally. If you haven't read Sapiens, read Sapiens. Like, it's crazy what we've done. We, if we see anything scary or big, we just kill them all. You know? <laughs> Instead of like asking the question of, is there a purpose to these beings that are magnificent? The saber-toothed tiger, the white lions, you know, these things that we hunt into extinction, why do we do it? It's out of fear. What are we afraid of? That nature's against us. How does that schism happen? How does one become afraid of its own nature? And I think it's deep within us, this schism of a belief that we are not cared for by the nature that has given us life. And so we've got a deep level of emotional abandonment disorder as a population. And so you guys are doing some big work on emotional healing in these recent weeks. And I want you to go into that a little bit right now because if there's anything we need to heal, it's a deep-seated abandonment disorder as a population. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing in this emotional clearance? Oh, my God. It is it is the reunification, the re-meeting of somebody's part of them that has been hiding for so long. The joyous, the, the, the bliss, the, the calm, the stillness, the happiness that they haven't truly felt, but also the anger, the fear, the grief, the sadness, the shame, the guilt, adding back the whole expansiveness of what it is to be a human, right? Connecting back to, wow, here's only societal and cultural and maybe even religious views of what I should be, and now we are shining the spotlight to these parts that have been in the shadows, which I've always been scared, right, to feel. But it's beautiful when someone feels fear, they have a brand new experience with it. They go, wow, I didn't have to feel fear be so afraid of feeling fear because when I was a kid, I felt fear and I didn't die. I'm still alive. So they re-feel those parts of them that are in fear or that are in anger. And then they transcend them and have a brand new relationship. So now they can go through life going, okay, yeah, I'm a little scared of that. Yeah, that's five out of 10, but now it's not a repressed 10 out of 10 where I feel it all in my body and it's permeating in every decision that I make. Uh, living in fear, right? The abandonment that I'm not taken care of. The moments when people re-meet them, parts of themselves, it is, it's just a snap of the finger. It's, I'm watching them and I go, there you go. They re-met the knowing that they are whole. They are taken care of. They are, it's fine. And it's so visible after in their face, their eyes are lit up and they're reconnected back to like, oh, I, I know why I'm here. Why did, oh my God, why was I so scared of? I really, you know what? I need to lay the boundaries with my mom, but now I'm so much more empowered. I'm so much more open. I'm so much more encouraged to do something that I've always wanted to do. For me, uh, in, in medicine and as a healer, this has been my calling, right? Um, to reconnect people back to who they are and then creating community around it. And that's what we've been seeing. And it's beautiful. beautiful. I didn't believe that healing can ever be this deep. I never believed it. And to see something like chronic pain, uh, IBS go away in one hour and stay away when I'm checking back one month, two month, three month. No, I'm still fine. Constipation go away in one hour. That's incredible, right? So it's like this incredible shift that as someone comes back to themselves, what does that look like in community? And then zooming out, what does that look like globally? So it's like we're doing this beautiful work for the world, right? Because I truly believe we are heading towards an, an, an extinction level event. The fertility, yeah. I've done the fertility shows. Yeah. I've talked about glyphosate. I know in my head, and I try to explain it with the simplest, most urgency that I can. Um, but, you know, the way that you put it and from the emotional standpoint that we're putting it, this is really powerful stuff. Well, that's the exciting thing that I see all over the place is the speed and completeness of healing, which is not something, there's not a single course in medical school called healing. Right. None absolutely goes unmentioned that healing happens. And it's obviously happening in every single one of us every single day or else we'd be dead at the moment of inception. The amount of cellular injury that happens in a given day from sunlight, from anything, from the chemicals we eat, whatever it is, are so gross that if we weren't healing constantly, we would just be done. Yeah. 
that we survive at any length of time is a huge testimony to the power of resilience and regeneration within a single body. And so we are resilient beings that are expressing a physical body around a light energy that we might call a soul or an energetic expression, whatever you can come to around that. But biology can't happen without an energetic centropy. And I think that's what a soul is. If you want to define what is a soul, is that some spiritual concept? No, it's a literal biophysics reality. Because if you don't have centropy, which is the opposite of entropy or chaos, if you don't have centropy, then you have no template of organization. If you have no organization and no sense of the greater purpose, then a liver cell has no idea why it's there or why it would be a liver cell or what it would do in the context of 70 trillion other cells. But it does know. It does know what to do, and it does know its identity when it's connected. And so these connected biologies are expressions of a master plan of you sitting there as an energetic being because you're not made of cells, you're made of atoms, and atoms are still in their physical expression only 0.0001% of reality. So what's the 99.99% of reality? It's an organized energy field in vacuum. Let me repeat that. You are an organized energy field within a vacuum that then organizes atoms, the small, tiny little physical properties of protons, in a certain pattern. Those protons, in their communication with black holes all over the universe, are taking information and expressing reality. And so the atomic structure that is organizing around your energetic form that we might call a soul is expressing this possibility of life. And then a body forms within a womb and becomes an embryo, becomes a fetus, becomes a newborn, and then comes into life in an expression of a personality, of a mission, of a purpose, of a co conviction and capacity for love, conviction and capacity for forgiveness, conviction and capacity for co-visioning. And so now we sit as souls, big energetic centers, across from each other and on a couch, but more importantly, above us in sacred geometry souls. And so these souls gather now at a, at a, a volume and, and penetrance never seen on earth before, 7.8 billion souls, energetic centers expressing life. And the life is chaotic seemingly in, in its motion, its death, its destruction, its extraction, its colonialism, its slavery, its all the sexual abuse and sex trafficking and child abuse and domestic violence and horrific in its chaos on one level. And yet while the humans play out the human drama of the emotional disconnect, the emotional abandonment that then leads to scarcity and our violence towards one another and the earth we live on, the souls remain in sacred geometry, doing their light work, doing their light work. And so I am convinced right now that we can let go of any judgment towards one another. That's a bad person. That's a good person. That's a person doing light work. That's a person that's just lost and dr drug addict or whatever. Whatever their human expression is, is only a tiny, tiny element of who they are as a being. And whatever journey they've chosen as a human was designed specifically to put their soul into that location in the sacred geometry of the 7.9 billion. And so the individual in prison at age 14 is holding a very specific place on the planet and can't move out of that cell. Maybe it goes to dinner once a day. Maybe it gets to walk for 45 minutes in the yard and come back in. That soul, for whatever reason, is holding an acupuncture point in space. Mm. And to say that it's broken or it's dysfunctional or it's bad or anything, that's an egoic construct. The reality is there is a, a centropy soul create in vacuum space organizing life around it. And the life has its simple purpose of, of grounding that soul onto the planet at this moment. Mm. Without the body, the soul is non-local. It actually doesn't have space-time. It's energetically, you know, expansive, moving, whatever. The body that manifests within that potential space roots that soul now, that, that energetic sphere in that space. And so I get really excited when I start to realize that we don't have a planet of 7.9 billion people. We have a planet of 7.9 billion souls that are animating humans. And then we have another trillions of 
you know, energetic centers that are animating the life of the bird and the tree, you know, the, the wolf in, in nature, the incredible beauty of a of, of flowering field of wildflowers. There is energetic centers expressing life all over this planet at different levels of beauty. And it is for the beauty of this planet that we can give reverence and have evidence for the amount of centropy that's within this universe. For what we see around us is not chaotic. It's actually exquisitely expressing a deeper truth. And its truth seems to be something around beauty. Mm. I feel that, man. I, I feel it because what it does is just surrender this, this judgmental expression of this good, this bad, this broken, but this very much so fixed. And just zooming out, which is a theme of our conversations, always zooming out and seeing that there's perfection in the organization of the expression, as you said, in a sacred geometry, then we can just completely open our hearts to being like, no, it is imperfection, which is sometimes a hard pill to swallow, being in this, you know, dense body, seeing with our own eyes, oh no, this is, this is really tough to swallow, right? All the, the dramas and the cruelties, like you mentioned, uh, of, of this existence. But maybe coming back to feeling that there is beauty in this world, um, how, how do we, if we turn on the news and the first 10 stories about how the world's going to shit, how do we reconnect with maybe there is more beauty than is meeting the eye? How do we reconnect with that? Yeah, I think step one is turn off the news. Um, we, we are, there's a great quote that we use in our nonprofit, Farmers Footprint, all the time, which is, humans are not made of cells, we're made of stories. And there's a lot of truth to that, in that the realities that we're capable of creating as energetic centers, and these centropy centers of energy that we might call a soul, are powerful manifestors. And we have manifested an incredible world. Um, just flew out of New York um, and caught this one photograph out of the window of the airplane that's just an awesome look at the depth and, and extent of the, the, the skyline of New York City. We manifested that thing. That mm -hmm. thing's huge and massive organism called a city. And it's complicated. It's got trillions of moving parts in it. And it's got an unbelievable capacity for generative change. It brings energy in and sends energy back out. It brings energy in, sends it back out. It brings billions of people there every decade. You know, like there's so much happening in that organism that we call a city. And we manifested that. So we're powerful manifestors the stories we listen to and choose to believe are what will shape our future. The news at large has the figured out the way to keep people riveted to the screen is to tell horrific stories. And so we are listening to the worst of humanity, if you want to use that judgmental context. And the reason we listen to it is because we are drawn to the drug effect of adrenaline. And so we tune into the news to get a little urge of stress hormone a little urge of stress hormone to justify the way that we feel. We feel desperate, we feel panicked, we feel disconnected, so we watch the news and be like, oh, that's what I'm feeling, because we're too afraid to realize that what we're really feeling is the chaos within ourselves, the disconnect within ourselves. And so we want to believe it's because of sex trafficking or because of the hurricane or because of the murder that happened over there. We want to hear the news so that it justifies the panic within us. The panic that is growing within us is because there is a deep schism between us as a human body and a human consciousness, a human mind, and the reality of our soul, which is infinite. We bring ourselves to a finite moment of extinction, which has to be disconnected from that energetic source that's infinite. And so we are bringing ourselves to this doomed state, and we're feeling the panic of that, of like, my God, the species could disappear. It's so interesting that we can feel the panic of extinction and we don't know where it's coming from. And so we attribute it to all these external phenomena. And so we watch the news to see the external phenomenon to blame what we're feeling deep inside is this deep knowingness that we are on the wrong path. Mm. We're not on a path for life at least. Maybe it's the right path. Maybe extinction is our path. That's maybe what we are supposed to do. But if we want to be alive, if we want to stay connected to these souls, and we want to continue to express biologic life that we would call human, then we need to choose a different path. And that path is not in a narrative you're going to find on TV. It's not on Netflix. 
It's not in your newsfeed. It's not on your Instagram. The narrative that you crave at that soul level is not there. And so it's going to begin at finding our own story, our new story. And I believe that in a strange way, this brings us back to food. Food, I don't believe, is the only source of energy for us to choose as an energetic species. There's lots of ways to get energy. Our Qigong masters uh, are, are a good example of this. They, they, they learn how to sun gaze to get energy into their body. So they watch with unblinking eye the rising sun coming up above the horizon. And they slowly train their eye to be able to have a huge capacity where they can watch the rise of that sun for hours. For me, once it comes even a millimeter off that thing, it gets too bright to look at. But they train their eyes to be able to take the light energy, and not only their eyes, but their whole body, to take the energetic exchange with the sun. And they'll fast for 40 days. No nutrients to deliver the sunshine. Instead, they're sun gazing, you know, morning and evening. And in that sun gazing, as we check their bloodstream, these studies have been done for 40 days, they will study them. They never shift into a, a biology of, of starvation or fasting. They stay in a fed state looking at the sun. So you don't need food to get light energy. But we have chosen food as the primary mechanism in our current three-dimensional experience. And I think it's because food has the ability to create fellowship. When you're sun gazing for energy, you have to be extremely focused and it's you and sun. When you're around food, it does its highest work when you're with others. It is a focus of community. And in the moment of a really good meal, where you walk away feeling buoyant and expanded is a, is a meal in which you got seen and heard. If you want your children to thrive, create a meal that inspires them to be seen and heard by somebody other than you as mom or dad. Create community, multi-generational community around your children at the dinner table and let them tell stories to the elders and let the elders tell them stories across the food and you will see a child regrounded in who they are perhaps seeing themselves for the first time in the eyes of an elder, in the eyes of a new mentor, in the eyes of some young person that inspires them. The blue zones around the planet differ greatly as to what types of food they eat. The blue zones are the ones where everybody lives over 100 years of age. Ikaria, Greece is, is one of these blue zones, one of the Grecian islands. And this couple came over uh, to prepare this five-course Greek meal for a group of us. And... Uh, it was an epic meal, and they had foraged for five days through Virginia to prepare this meal. And uh, one of the courses was just an onion that had been baked, and this peeled onion in the middle of a plate, baked in love. And this woman discussed how how the onion was picked from the ground before it got big, because big onions are bitter. And she told, laughed at American onions and all this. And and so she's telling us about each thing. By the time she got, and you put that bite of food in after she tells you about it, everybody's crying. Every single course you're crying because of the beauty and the love and the attention and the awareness that got baked into that piece of food. And you're now receiving it in your new awareness of it. So at the end of this huge meal, I gave this toast about the microbiome and how we had just experienced this explosion and the microbiome was going to make us more conscious. I thought it was brilliant. And I uh, finished the toast, and the guy from Ikaria gets up and says, that's very interesting, doctor, thick Greek accent, but you're completely wrong. He says, the reason we live to 100 years and beyond in Ikaria is because we always set an extra chair at the dinner table hoping that somebody we don't know stops by. And that just completely changed everything for me. Like, if that is true, then how far have I missed the story of food? glyphosate, nutrients, lack of nutrients, the whole thing I'd been preaching for decades and I'd missed the whole point of food, which was that food desires to be the focus of fellowship and to ex create a centropy moment between souls. The sacred geometry of souls around a dinner table occur because of the food. The food chooses to be a, a focus point for human fellowship such that we would find our, our identity back in the soil systems, understanding the unity between soil microbes, the plant rootlets, the mycorrhizae, the whole mix that we've talked about becomes food. Why? So that we would share it. Why? So that we would see one another. Why? Because when we see each other, we fall in love. You've, seen, you've heard that thing, if you stare long enough, two minutes into somebody's eyes, you'll fall in love. 
two minutes is easy to achieve around a dinner table. Unfortunately, we're no longer eating our meals around dinner tables. Mm. Something like 35% of meals in the United States are now not only being eaten alone, they're being eaten alone behind a steering wheel on the road. We're no longer experiencing food as a focus of fellowship, and therefore the food is losing its purpose. Therefore, it is not appreciated for what it is, and therefore how could it possibly give us nourishment for what we are? And so we have to find our reverence back around the dinner table again. So how can you start to change the narrative of who we are as humanity? Are we really a species disconnected from our nature that will cause the extinction of a planet in our sense of scarcity that comes from a sense of abandonment? Or do we heal the abandonment disorder emotionally, step into our, our harmonious state and start to share food again to have fellowship around a table with multiple generations, with people that have differing viewpoints? Biodiversity is the language of life. It is what makes it resilient, it is what makes it constantly increasing in its intelligence is biodiversity. When you create a monoculture, plant corn across 10,000 acres, you destroy the creativity and the capacity for life on that thing. When you create monoculture of thinking and belief in your household, you destroy the vitality and creativity and capacity of that household to participate in society in a positive way. We need biodiverse ideas. We need biodiverse perspectives. We need to have reverence for one another in our journeys because all of these are light beings. Do you want to meet another light being? Do you want to fall in love with another light being tonight? Then look into somebody's eyes and prepare a meal out of love and, and share in the opportunity to see one another for a moment. In that, we will see another light being and we will feel the vitality of life and we will create a different narrative, a different story as to who we are. Whew, got chills, man. I'm thinking about how disconnected I've become from food just hearing you, right? Because I may not eat it behind a steering wheel, but I sure as hell eat it like while I'm texting someone or finishing up emails or maybe quickly put on something on Netflix and then head out. We, at the house, we don't even sit down at the table much, maybe yeah. once or twice a week. That's right. But when we do, it's so fulfilling and ritualistic, and it's finally like, oh, yeah, that's why I'm in love with you. You know, like, we're finally connecting again, right? Eating at the right time. So I'm so inspired. You're telling me this, and I was like, why did I buy such a small dinner table? <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. I need to double the size of this dinner table. And then I think about how we just had another couple over and we sat and it was one of my best memories in the house so far, right? We had all the food in the middle. We had these mocktail elixirs that we had and we sat and we just told stories and they asked me questions that we didn't ask at parties or at the beach together, but they were asking me real questions. And I was like, holy shit, they're really seeing me and these are my friends who I've known for years. They're learning stuff about me on this table that they never did. And you're telling me this, and it just quickly flashed back to that moment. I was like, it was all around the reverence for food. We made the food. We prepared the elixirs nicely for each other. We put mint and basil, and it was ritualistic. And I felt so close to all of them, um, including my partner. And I was like, this is incredible. So to think about the blue zones, and you're right, I always wondered, these people eat different foods. Some eat meat, some eat plants, some, what's, what's going on? And, and I think you perfectly captured the energy of what, these, what goes on in these communities. And it is that bonding and it is that empowering of the youth, you know, to, to, to speak their truth. I'm seeing I'm heard today by grandpa. Oh, who is this new friend of my, my dad? He, he needs to hear my truth too, you yeah. know? What a beautiful moment. And you literally, in the snap of a finger, just shifted the way that I want to have a table with children and what I want to open up as a family one day. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Icaria Grace, for bringing the message for us. Thank <laughs> you. Um, I mean, look, I don't want to keep you here for three hours, <laughs> but we could. Um, is there anything else really that, that you didn't touch on that really is important for you to say before we wrap it up? I think I want to just leave another message of hope for all of us, really, at this point. Um, it's overwhelming because when, you, you know, those of you who are listening to the podcast or whatnot, when you're participating in this conversation, it's close to home. There, you are one degree of separation from somebody dying from cancer or autoimmune disease or major depression or suicide or, you know, struggling with fertility and miscarriages and the whole thing. It's an emotional thing to see the state of 
and how we're participating in this state of collapse and somehow normalizing this state of collapse, so much so that it didn't dawn us that this wasn't normal 20 years ago. No, it was not normal ever. And so in this desperate emotional moment of chaos that seems to be you know, inevitably leading us down, I want to invite us to understand that extinction doesn't have to include humanity. It just has to include the version of humanity that we currently have. And so we need the version of humanity that sees itself from separate and scarce from, from resources, therefore has developed an egoic mind. That's what needs to die. That's what needs to go extinct, is the ego. And the ego is not and it, something that one individual has. It's a, it's a collective energy that we all grab onto, which is a defense mechanism. It's a barrier that we use to, to exercise against fear. What are we fearing? And therefore, what do we put shame and guilt towards one another for? What do we really fear? Do we fear death is one of the most important things to consider. If you're afraid of death and you think it's an end point and you think that there's a scarcity of life to occur in the universe. And so drill into that, lean in hard to that and think, is there really destruction of energy such that there's just nothing after I die? Or is this energy center that's currently organizing in this incredible centropy of a life going to persist? We know energy can't be destroyed. So where is that energy going to go? What is it going to animate next? And so if we start to understand death as a rebirth rather than an end point, if we can really free ourselves up and shake it out, shake it out, do the emotion of clearing, do, do you fear death? For as long as you do, you're probably not going to be alive. You're probably going to live a truncated you know, scar life of scarcity to really blossom into life. You lose your fear of death. You realize, I am constantly in a rebirth process. An elder who dies in their joy is rebirthing into this extraordinary light being on the other side that will then animate life somewhere else. We are these explosive capacities for life. That's what we are. And once we really sink into that, we will tell ourselves a different narrative. And so we will see the extinction of the current humanness, but not necessarily the humanity we may actually see humanity rise in its humanitarianism for the first time when we realize life is not limited to the human experience. And the hope that I would instill in you right now is that the solution and the, the transformation that needs to happen for the future that we all feel in our hearts as possible is not a human construct. It is a nature construct. And what's happening around the planet right now is species are rallying to organize themselves into a regenerative potential on the planet. We see this at the macro level with behavior of whales and dolphins and uh, keystone species like the wolves in, in uh, Yellowstone, the lions being reintroduced, uh, reintroduced in South Africa, the beavers being reintroduced introduced along river systems in the American Southwest and in, in the UK. And, we have species being reintroduced and those species immediately know how to rewild the world for vitality. And so when we realize that rewilding is the answer to everything, when we allow the earth to rewild itself, when we let it unbury itself from the concrete jungles we've created and allow nature to start to express itself again, biodiversity returns immediately, vitality returns immediately and the plant planet goes on to heal not only what's been, but to birth what will be. And the intelligence always explodes, the diversity always explodes after an extinction level stressor. After the last extinction, we went from reptiles to birds to mammals. After the last extinction, we went from ferns and, and palms to fields of wildflowers, deciduous trees, autumn with the falling leaves, spring with the flowering trees. None of that existed before the last extinction. It took an extinction level stress to create the opportunity for life again. That opportunity is actually created by the virome. Viruses are the new genetic potential of the planet. Uh, the, the human, our biology as mammals was to, is, is the direct result of viruses updating that of, of reptiles. The human genome is over 55% direct insertions from viruses. And therefore we had all these gain of function events. 
the function that allows a placenta to occur such that there could be a live birth instead of an egg of a reptile, took a couple of new viral updates. Viruses are just, are not living beings. They're not microbiome. That's a huge misperception in science. Viruses are simply the genetic language of potential life, potential new avenues for life to follow. When you put stress on an organism, it starts sending out more and more viruses to find new pathways to survive the extinction-level stress that's there. And so by putting extinction-level stress on the planet, humanity right now is increasing the amount of potential the Earth has to express life next. Mm. So are we really a bad thing? Should we release judgment on ourselves for a moment and say, oh, we're just the current existential threat to life on Earth such that all of life on Earth expresses something far beyond its current expression. And if we stop being the existential threat, we've left behind that chapter of humanity a new potential for life to occur. And I guarantee it will be more beautiful and more vibrant and more intelligent, whatever it does next. And if we stay to play, we might be witness to a new species, perhaps, many new species that express more intelligence than we do as a human mind mm. or as a human society. Or humanity gets its own viral updates and we get our upgrades and humanity 2.0 looks much different and we express life much differently and we express love towards one another much differently and the veil is taken off the eye and we can see beauty much differently. And that's my hope is that are we actually really about to birth for the first time? Are we just in the birth canal right now? And the previous 200,000 years was a march towards our own extinction of a small belief of who we are so that we could be birthed into a much bigger understanding of who we really have potential to express. And what a beautiful, just an understanding that this birth canal can be uncomfortable and it can be dark and we can be like, where the hell are we? we where are we dying. going? We think, I'm, I'm, this must be death, <laughs> you know? And we feel like the intensity of it. But what a gift, because either way, there's beauty on the other side. How do we know? We've seen it with other extinction level events. So why do we hold on to so much stress and so much of like, oh no, this is the end, versus like letting ourselves just be free and being like there's beauty in all of it. Ah, oh, it makes me take a big, it's funny, in the beginning I was like, oh, extinction, we're gonna die, and now it's like the breath at the end. And, and it's a beautiful way to close this and really give us a lot of encouragement and hope uh, because it, there's so much right here in front of us to upgrade ourselves and witness, you know, our great, 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 great grandchildren seeing the new world, how it may look, and then maybe just another version of us, you know? Maybe I'm a lion and you're a tiger and we're just running around uh, the Serengeti together. That's it. And just doing lion and tiger stuff, man. That's it. That's it. I, I appreciate you so much. Um, what, where, one, where do people find you? What are some projects coming? Like everyone, for, if this is the first time they're hearing you, tell us, tell us everything. <laughs> uh, first of all, if you want to find me, just close your eyes and take a deep breath and relax. And I'll be there. Like that's how close we are as, as energetic beings to one another. Uh, my voice will be in your head. My, my love will be in your heart. Uh, close your eyes and take a deep breath. You don't need social media to connect with me. You don't need anything to connect. Just close your eyes and take a deep breath and maybe a smile on your face on this dorky new friend you have, Zach, and just let me be present with you and uh, let, let my vibration reinforce the, the hope within you and let my vibration reveal the beauty within you. Uh, that's, that's how you can really find me, I think. But... If you feel the need to connect through other avenues, then certainly you can do that. ZachBushMD.com is my education platform. I've got uh, many, many hours of free education there. If you click on the Knowledge button, we have the Global Health Education Series that's been going on for a couple of years, and I go into deep depth on what viruses are, uh, what, what death and rebirth looks like uh, through the veil of hospice work, and death doulas on that panel. And uh, we go in deep into GMO and, and where we're at as we've gotten to a much more terrifying level with genetically modified organisms than I've shared here. And so if you want to do some deep dives, ZachBushMD.com will get you into that space. Uh, you can reach out through the newsletter there or sign up for the newsletter and get information through there and events that occur. Um, if you want to just get the daily updates as kind of what's going on in my world, um, ZachBushMD on Instagram or Facebook will get you there. 
and then uh, into the soil science of our laboratory over the last 10 years, intelligenceofnature.com will get you into the ways in which we've been able to uh, study the ways in which we can extract that communication network of bacteria and fungi and put that into dietary supplements for humans to include in their experience of a meal, to put the intelligence of, the, of ancient soil back into your, your daily experience before you eat uh, as a way for you to nourish your body in a new level. And uh, in an ironic way, nature put into our soils 55 million years ago the antidote to Roundup. And so that's what we work on in the laboratory is the way that soils have the antidote to this horrible toxin uh, to accelerate the repair of protein structures, the alkaloid production, amino acid repair, all this different stuff that's uh, become obvious that nature does for us. So intelligenceofnature.com there. If you're on a journey of intense kind of emotional, physical uh, stress and you feel like your health is collapsing, we have an eight-week program where we pair you with a one-on-one -on -one coach or even group coaching at a cheaper price point. Um, it's called Journey of Intrinsic Health, and we reveal to you how we can go far beyond not just Western medicine, but we need to, we need to get out of our biohacking mentality of like more data is good. And we need you to listen into your deep knowing truth of your path to wellness and vitality is within you. So we spend eight weeks with you, giving you a lot of information on how to organize your lifestyle around reju rejuvenative or regenerative biology. And we do that in the context of letting you listen deeper and deeper into your relationship with everything around you, your relationship to your own breath, your own food, your own water, your own fasting cycles, your own emotional you know, context, your own belief of who you are. Change your relationship to all these things over that eight-week period so you can be a more pure expression of the beauty within you. Journeyofintrinsichealth.com will get you to that program. You can also find it on the Zach Bush site if you forget that. Um, but it's it's an opportunity for us to engage on a long, large scale. Okay. Uh, if you want to take a look at the power of biomimicry in our future technologies, we've spent the last seven years building a 40-foot mitochondria that takes plastics and other toxic uh, waste like tires and farm waste and puts it into biodiesel and biofuels for the future. That uh, company is called Resource Dynamics. ResourceDynamics.com will get you there, and you can take a look at uh, a, a machine that mimics the mitochondria within your cells and, and digests 100,000 pounds of waste a day per reactor we build. And we're about to go global with that uh, company to give you hope that uh, this whole story of poisoning of oceans and plastics everywhere and all that, that's, there's no larger you know, resource of energy on the planet than plastic right now. And when you realize that that's a pure energy form, it stops being a waste stream and starts to be able to close the loop on carbon cycles on the planet and for us to really realize a regenerative energy system lies within our plastics that we've so demonized. And so there's an opportunity for you to just take a look at that company as to like, oh my gosh, everything I'm thinking is bad is actually an opportunity. Right. And so resource dynamics, good example of that in our lives. So uh, take a look deep into all of that. If you want to help out on the nonprofit side, we have a very successful program supporting farmers, not only in the U.S., but around the world now, farmersfootprint.us. If you're in Australia, uh, there's the farmersfootprint.org.au. We're also launching in the U.K. And, and South Africa in the next couple months, so keep an eye out for Farmers Footprint. And uh, I'm excited to keep engaged with all of you. And I encourage all of you to go run by a grocery store, pick up some ingredients, and cook a meal tonight for somebody you don't know. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Zach Bush. As always, I like this once a year thing. Maybe we'll see you next year <laughs> yeah. with some newest updates. Pleasure to have you on, man. Appreciate Thank it. You. Appreciate you, Dr. G. Thank you for being you. Oh, cereal, cereal, cereal. This is the childhood favorite, right? If you're like me, you couldn't wait to eat your cereal every morning. Man, I remember the variety packs with all those little cereal boxes, right? And I got older, and all of a sudden I got to be able to dip into the standard size ones. But I remember the cabinet in my childhood kitchen, and I would have the Lucky Charms leprechaun just eyeing me, right? Inviting me for that magically delicious meal. Or the Trix Rabbit. Remember, oh my God, those colors? I remember the milk would turn pink from all those synthetic dyes, but I didn't care. Oh, but my favorite, my favorite was Frosted Flakes. Man, Tony the Tiger, he got me so good with that marketing when I was a kid. I remember the commercials and me being the performer that I was when I was little, I would mimic him and I'd 
take the spoonful and my first bite I go there, great, right? Just like that commercial, but man, this was part of my life. The cereal was my ritual. It was my entrance into feeling the staple of happiness. It was probably just a sugar rush, but I felt great with it. I'd be in high fructose heaven when I ate these cereals. The morning cartoons right there in front of me, I'd see the vivid colors of all the cartoons and I'd hear my dad yelling in the background, I need to finish eating and get dressed. But I would savor the last few minutes with my sugary, sweet soiree in my mouth. And this was my life for so long until I got older, right? And, and maybe I remember moving to oatmeal or whole wheat waffles or whatever it was. And maybe my mom and dad got wind that I was on track for prediabetes, right? But all those sugary cereals at some point stopped for so many years. And I didn't realize how much I used to love cereal when I was a kid. And then I was a poor medical student and there came a wave of new healthy cereals that came out. And all of a sudden, Whole Foods started gaining popularity, right? And we saw Trader Joe's popping up here and there. And all of a sudden, there was the advent of the healthy cereal movement. And I was so excited, right? Because I was reuniting with this staple food that was part of my ritual, my first ever ritual as a child. So I went healthy cereal shopping and I went crazy. I couldn't wait to get my childlike paws on these brands. And I remember coming back to my apartment and I had four bowls lined up or maybe even five and all of the cereal boxes behind it, right? I was doing my own taste test. So then healthy cereal number one, the first spoon, I chewed it. It tastes like cardboard and dried berries, right? I was like, what is this? This is not what I remember cereal being. Okay, cereal number two, it tasted like a ball of oats in witch hazel. It was so dry. Uh, and then cereal number three, this has to be the good one if I'm thinking in my mind. It tastes like wheat germ and moldy spices, right? Who wants savory when they have their cereal? No, we want like that sweet kick. And the last one, I was ready to lose my faith in all healthy cereals. And I was like, okay, this one's not bad. I don't remember the brand, but I remember one cereal really drew me in. And all of a sudden, that movement of cereals came in, but most of them were mediocre to crappy tasting for quite a while. And then came the next movement, and this is the more recent one. And these were the new, trendy, nicely branded cereals, the magic spoons, the three wishes, the lovebirds of the world. So today, I'm going into how to spot a good quality cereal and what brands are Dr. G approved. So when you buy cereal, there are a few rules that you need to keep in mind, especially if you're doing it for yourself or your children. USDA organic always when you buy cereal. A lot of these companies are using wheat or grains or beans or legumes, and they're highly sprayed with many herbicides and pesticides, one of them being the most detrimental, glyphosate. Big concern. We know that even in low doses, it destroys the gut microbiome. Even more dramatically, it affects the tight junctions of the gut. So really important to pay attention. Gotta be USDA organic when you buy your cereal, because it's gonna cause inflammation. Number two, you wanna make sure that the companies are using whole ingredients. And most of these are gonna, but a lot of these are also gonna be using natural flavors, gums, stabilizers, and sometimes they'll use synthetic vitamins and minerals. So you really wanna keep an eye on this. And number three, this is a big one, seed oils. A lot of these cereals are utilizing seed oils and you know I'm not a big fan of them. They are essential to avoid because they're inflammatory to the body. They become oxidants in our body, they stress our system and make our DNA vulnerable to damage, which is a big problem. And you may notice if you're eating a snack or a cereal and you're always getting bloating or you're feeling full really fast, you feel in your gut is inflamed, changes in your bowel movements, pay attention because it might be that the seed oils are really affecting your gut. They have an affinity for affecting the gut. Now, before I go into all these cereals, understand cereal isn't the best, number one, nutritionally dense choice for a breakfast. What I'm talking about is a little bit more of a guilty pleasure. So I actually would say if you are eating cereal, add some fiber. Cut up some apple, put some raspberries or blueberries, add some fiber into your cereal to help attenuate any sugar spikes that you may be having. So here are some of the healthy ones, healthy ones, quote unquote, that are lower tier. Three wishes. I love the ingredients. They're simple, but they gotta be organic. If you're gonna eat chickpeas and it's gonna be what the cereal is made out of, it has to be organic, particularly because Glyphosate is a big concern when it comes to chickpeas. You don't want to be consuming glyphosate as an adult, and you certainly don't want to be giving glyphosate to your children. So until we see Three Wishes utilize organic chickpeas, I'd say stay away from this one. Cascadian Farms, I don't like that much. They are really heavy on the core, and a lot of people can't really tolerate it. 
although uh, the corn is organic, uh, they also have sunflower oil. Remember I was just talking about seed oils? This is one to avoid. But I do love that their cereal is organic. I don't like that a lot of their cereals are pretty sugary. Magic Spoon. This one has beautiful branding, but I, I don't really like it that much. It's high in protein, great. Gluten-free, low sugar, great. Like I mentioned, the beautiful branding that will just pull me in as a consumer. But I don't understand why they insist on having whey protein as their first ingredient. This is one of the main ingredients that a lot of people can't handle, especially in the gut. They're going to get bloating. They're going to get heartburn. They may have changes in the bowels. Whey protein is really intolerable to a lot of people. Their sweetener blend has allulose, which is still going to cause bloating for a lot of people. I have no idea why they're using peanut oil, another one of the seed oils that I say stay away from. And the natural flavors, they say, isn't artificial or they don't use any preservatives. So until Magic Spoon utilizes the organic label, I would say they still are a ways away of playing with the real big boys of cereal. Kashi Golene, oh my God, this is one of the worst healthy cereals, quote unquote, that I have seen. They are non-organic, but one of their first ingredients is soy, corn, honey, more corn, wheat, expeller pressed soy oil, oats, natural flavors. It's a terrible list of ingredients because none of them are organic. You have to, have to, have to be utilizing the organic label. You have to have an organic certification if you have soy, if you have corn, if you have wheat, if you have oats. So very, very important to understand this is one of the first healthy cereals out there, but it's one of the worst ones on the market. Stay away from this one. The same thing goes with the puffin cereal. I would stay away from it. Non-organic, but they use corn, they use oats, they use cinnamon, natural flavors, vitamins. We don't know the sourcing. High, high risk of being sprayed with a lot of pesticides and herbicides. Any cereal is organic, but really crappy ingredients, so I would just move past it. I actually like the forager one as a whole, minus the seed oils. If they remove the seed oils, maybe add coconut oil or something else, it'd be a much better formula. Um, this one is on the brink of being really good, but I still wouldn't eat it. Nature's Path, it's organic, better ingredients. I don't like that they use brown rice flour in particular because when consumed every day, you are predisposing yourself to having high amounts of heavy metals in your food, and they tend to have a lot of sugar. It's marketed to children. I've had the Nature's Path ones like the koala crisps, or you'll see them at Whole Foods, they have all of these different animals. And I know they're marketed to children, but you better believe sometimes I'll pick up some for myself because it satisfies my sweet tooth. So here are the higher tier ones. There are only three that I really like. My favorite one overall is the Lovebird one. Really awesome ingredients, simple ingredients. USDA organic label, always. It's grain free for people who are avoiding grains and it's really good tasting. I love Lovebird. One Degree Organics are really going also. Love that they're organic, glyphosate free. They use whole oats, coconut palm sugar for the apple one, dried apple, flaxseed, cinnamon, unrefined salt. Really good flavor. This is one of the better ones. Arrowhead Mills is the other one. Um, I also have the maple buckwheat one in my pantry. That is the gluten-free one. And they also use simple ingredients, organic. I would love to see this company reduce the sugar, but the same goes for all of these cereals. Add fiber, again, add blueberries or raspberries or apples when you're eating these cereals to attenuate any sugar spikes so you feel good when you eat them. But there you have it, cereals across the board. Some of them are fake healthy, some of them are okay healthy, could do a lot better, and some of them are really good. Now, you are empowered when you go shopping and you wanna buy cereal for yourself, for your loved ones, your family, your children. Now you got some good companies, and also you have the ways to shop for good cereals for anyone that I didn't mention. I really hope that helped you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this wonderful show. I really hope you got a lot out of this guest segment that we had. I hope you had a lot out of this knowledge bomb. You go in and get your favorite cereals and knowing you're doing right by your family. Thank you so much for supporting the show. If you haven't, please rate, please review, please subscribe to this show. Help it grow. Go on YouTube, subscribe, let's grow that. Share this with your friends, share this with your family. Taking a few minutes out of your day makes a major, major impact on the show. I appreciate you all and I will see you next week.